Welcome back to our Feed the Soul Virtual Summit. This is our uh, final session with our panel of former athletes. Uh, we have three ladies that have joined us and we have some more that will uh, join us in a minute. Uh, we're gonna get started um, in a few seconds by having all of them introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about their athletic journey. Uh, but like every other session, wanted to remind you that this is being recorded we will share the recording with all the participants after the event. Um, and you can also ask questions at any time during the conversation. You can do so by going into the Q&A box um, and writing your question. I will record them and, and ask them to the audience. So um, with, uh, uh, with this, we're going to get started perhaps with uh, Neha, if you can tell us a little bit about uh, you and, and your sport and where you come from. Sure. So my name is Neha Oberoi. Um, I'm from New Jersey and Florida. Uh, I played professional tennis for five years on the WTA tour. I got to top 200. Um, I also went back to school uh, and graduated from Princeton in 2012 and just recently got my master's at Columbia uh, in 2020. That was great. Thank you. Um, um, Allison, do you want to go next? Sure. My name is Allison Williams. Uh, I'm a synchronized swimmer. That's actually how I met Miriam. Uh, and I was on the U.S. national team on and off from 2006 to 2016. I participated in three world championships and two Pan American Games and then retired from elite competition in 2016. Since then, I've been coaching and I also went back to school at UCLA to get my bachelor's in sociology. And I'll be starting an upcoming master's degree in the School of Education at UCLA uh, in about a month. Great. Thanks, Ali. Um, Lashinda? Oh, she disappeared just as we got started. She'll come back in a minute. Um, ladies, while we still will have you here, uh, and before Lashinda comes back, and, and Brenda and Laundry as well, um, Neha, can you tell us a little bit about um, your transition um, from tennis um, and some of the struggle that, that you experienced at that time? Yeah, sure. So I actually ended my career pretty early, actually, as I was sort of moving up in the ranks. Um, I had a career ending eating disorder. Um, I was around 21, 22 when I decided that um, I really couldn't continue playing on the tour anymore for my own mental health as well as my physical health. And um, even though I had a really great plan B, a great education plan in front of me, I really struggled with um, kind of coming out of the athlete identity and understanding that this part of my life was over and that I was going to have to uh, reshape and kind of um, try out some new identities. I think that was really difficult. I felt very alone. Uh, tennis uh, in and of itself is a singular sport. So it's not like I retired with a bunch of teammates or other people who I could relate to. Um, I didn't have a lot of friends coming off the tour. Uh, women's tennis uh, has been in the past notoriously pretty cutthroat. So there wasn't a lot of support or people around me that were going through similar things that I could reach out to. I remember going on Google to the library trying to find, you know, are, are there other people like me who've gone through this, who've had, you know, athletic eating disorders and I got, I was really privileged. I was lucky that I was trying to get professional help with the eating disorder and later with my mental health. But I really suffered um, in finding people, professionals, therapists, um, mentors that could understand what this journey was like and what I was going through. I think uh, it, it really hampered my quick, potentially it could have been a quick transition just because people didn't understand what it was that I was dealing with. And uh, I think I really took it upon myself to try to fix something that was wrong with me that I felt like what's wrong with me for so long. And I think that this kind of transition journey is what led me to the work that I do now. Um, and I'm really happy to see more and more people publish about their, um, or talk about their, their difficulty in their journeys because that wasn't the case 10, 15 years ago. So I think for me, the biggest piece was uh, the identity, you know, trying to find uh, a new identity or understanding that um, tennis was behind me. 
uh, and coming to terms with kind of how the career ended and how that played out in my family dynamics um, and as well as in my, uh, my social identity as well. Absolutely. Um, can you tell us again, what, what, how long has it been since you retired? Yes, so I retired uh, in 2008. Uh, so it's been almost 12 years. And I think that it took me a good six to eight years to really feel like I was out of that struggle, whether you know it was day to day and then it became kind of month to month and then it slowly got better and better. Uh, but it, it did take me quite a few years to um, reground, you know, find purpose, find fulfillment, and move forward. Yeah, and and listen, I think it's pretty common, and we'll we'll hear that a fair bit. That you know, it takes quite some time. Uh, Lashinda, since you joined us uh, back, can you go through um, who you are, what was your sport when you retired, um, just as a, a quick introduction, please. Yes. So um, I'm Lashinda. I'm a 400 meter hurdler. I used to be a 400 meter hurdler in track and field. A two time Olympian and Olympic silver medalist in the 2012 Olympics um, in London. Um, I was the former American record holder, um, world champion, and a couple of world medals, uh, silver and bronze. Um, throughout the years from like 2004 through 2013. Uh, suffered from injuries the last few years of my career. So 2014 through 17, um, suffered with injuries and never could just really get back on top of my game and uh, retired in 2017. And it was a forced retire. <laughs> I'm so um, super competitive. So I couldn't even stand that um, competing at my best was not an option anymore. So that's what kind of forced my retirement. Um, so similar, my service went out, so I missed the bulk of your, um, intro, but, um, similar to what I heard, and I think I'm still in that process of you saying like those first few years when you're retired, I'm still in that process now, but I do feel like I'm gaining a little momentum of like heading in the right direction of, you know, where I want to be or where I'm trying to go. But, um, identity struggle is something that, um, I deal with and I think it's more so of um, when you know that you were really good at something and you, you, you're you entering this new world um, where you have to start from scratch and that hours and years and minutes and seconds um, are taken away that you put into one thing or one gift or talent and you're now saying that that doesn't matter anymore. It holds no weight so you have to start over and do it again in this area. And so it, that's difficult for me to say uh, I was the best in the world at something, but now I don't even know what I am right now. So it's, it's just hard to uh, kind of accept that. And um, I think that, like you said, track and field, like tennis, is an individual sport. So... It wasn't until recently I actually had a conversation with uh, someone that he said, well, you should reach out to a ton of people and um, you, you're just not used to doing that. You're used to figuring out things on your own, finding out ways and solutions that you can fix whatever problems you have because it's an individual sport. So I'm so used to managing myself, my career, uh, my goals, myself, that I've never had anyone to speak to. Uh, or thought that that was necessary because I knew that it all depended on me. So uh, uh, another thing to, hard thing to accept is um, knowing that in this business world or alter world, whatever you're choosing to go into, um, a lot of things is determined by what other people think and how they judge how prepared you are to do something. So um, that's another thing that I struggle with, but uh, what I've been doing and what I found that kind of eases my anxiety because it gives me extreme anxiety to just think of not being prepared or someone feeling that I'm not prepared or capable of doing something is uh, just kind of join whatever training they have out there in um, the world that I'm trying to enter in, which is like sports entertainment and uh, just take the training courses, build that resume and build my network because that's another thing that I have to work out with. So 
Um, I recently did the Legends Sales Training Program, which is uh, they're, they're they're selling the tickets for the 2020 Olympic Games in LA, uh, the LA Chargers, LA Rams, new stadiums, uh, international uh, international company in sports entertainment, and um, just just learning that network is extremely important and that that's an effort in itself and an art to learn uh, has helped me realize that I have some ground to cover, but at least I know kind of the direction I'm going to and what I need to do. So that's uh, where I'm at right now. That makes sense. Um, thanks, Lashinda. We'll, we'll actually, I'll touch base on this in a minute because it was, it relates to one of the topic we covered this morning. Um, Ali, can you tell us about, about your transition and, and sort of where you're at to now? Can you hear me? Sure. So I was part of the national team all the way up until 2016. And at that time, the team of 12 athletes had dwindled down to just the three of us who are remaining um, in the Olympic duet uh, group. And I was let go from that only about a month or two out from the Olympic Games. Uh, so I was basically forced out. And there wasn't really anything left to be part of because the training center had just kind of dissolved and disintegrated and there was not anybody training there anymore. So there just wasn't any choices for me to, there was nothing for me to be part of. So that, that was it. It was just time I had to go on. Uh, luckily I was able to get um, a job as a head coach soon after that, which I think for me helped provide, helped um, kind of turn things around. I was able to feel like I was able to mentor young athletes and kind of give some meaning to my experiences through that process. Uh, but one thing that's come up for me in the last four years of healing is trying to reclaim the joy in actually doing my sport for myself, uh, instead of doing it kind of as a robot or as a clone for Team USA or for somebody else or under the guidance or leadership, um, or abuse of another an organization, um, really to reconnect to actually why I did it in the first place and reconnect to that feeling of flow and joy. Now, it's kind of interesting because synchronized swimming is actually a sport that there are opportunities to do outside the Olympic sphere. Like, you know, you can perform, you could perf you could go professional at Larev in Las Vegas, although that just closed with the pandemic, but that's another story. Um, there are different ways that you can do it. You can also just do it for yourself. And even recently, I've really rediscovered just dancing in the ocean with some of my mermaid friends and that's been hard to do because there's a lot of mermaids around me but none of them really want anything to do with the water because they all just like left and didn't want to go back but this rec reclamation process of getting back into nature and getting back into the ocean and realizing wow this is really cool i'm one of the only people in the world that can dance in the ocean in the waves uh, and just take the joy back for myself has been really healing and i feel like i've I, I feel fulfilled with my competitive career at this point. And I feel like actually connecting with nature was always what I really wanted. And I was kind of actually looking in the wrong place. And now I realize like, oh, this is actually what I wanted all along. I just didn't know how to find it. So I feel gratitude for many people along the way who helped kind of usher me through the pain and suffering of the retirement process and get to something that is actually much more interesting and fulfilling for me. Great. Girls, that's, that's fabulous because you touched on many different topics that we're going to go back to. Uh, Brenda, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Yes, um, thank you for having me a little late. No worries. We, um, we actually started with a, uh, an introduction of, of each one of the ladies and um, just telling us, you know, uh, what was your sport, your key career achievement um, in sport, and then when you retired and where you're at now. So um, if you can go through the same thing, that would be awesome. Thank you. Yes, hello everyone. My name is Brenda Villa. Uh, I played water polo for Team USA for four Olympics and four time medalist, but I guess the crowning jewel was the, the gold medal in London. And now I've been retired for, for eight years and I work at an independent all girls school in the Bay Area. And I've been able to connect my passion for um, equity in aquatics and access to the work that I do here at um, the school that I'm at. But it, it did take a few years to kind of narrow that down and see um, what jobs I could do um, in addition to coaching after I retired. 
how um, I'm going to start with you, Brenda, and, and we'll, we'll circle back with the um, the other girls. Um, can you tell us a little bit? You know, you you had a very successful career. You achieved the highest level. Um, my guess is you chose to write to retire when you retired. Um, can you tell us what were your biggest challenges after you retired and whether you were expecting them or not? You know, I think the change in, I guess, in my identity, right? I was identified as this top level water polo player for so long. Then when I decided to, to retire and I was taking the rest of the year to process and to figure out what I was going to do. It kept hitting me that I didn't, I didn't have the belief that I could ever be as good as I was in water polo and anything else. And it was so hard, so hard. So much of my identity was wrapped in into that water polo identity and many phone calls to our sports psychologist that the USOC provided um, Peter Haberl, I don't know if anybody else worked with Peter, but right, many phone calls, many tears. And I'm, I'm lucky that I had mentors, my college coach, great mentor that just helped me and walked me through that process. And there were some things in place before I, I retired because I knew I was going to retire because I was 32 years old, chased this Olympic gold medal for 16 years. And I, I knew that I eventually wanted to try to be a mom, be married and do all these other things. So I needed to stop there. There isn't in my sport. There's no way you could do both. There's no financial support like other sports may have. Um, so I'm, I'm lucky that I had some mentors to walk me through it, but it was a hard, I would say another four years. No, maybe not four, like maybe two and a half where it was still like, is this, is this what I'm doing? Who am I? And now I will say I'm in a better place, but I still think back to those 16 years and I wish so much more could have been done to help me um, once I decided to walk away. Yeah, and you, you're, you, know, you touched on what the other girls have said too around, around the identity and, and managing that loss of identity. Um, we actually talked a lot during the summit and the last two days on, on building the whole athlete during your your years of, of competition so that you can be better prepared, so that you have your network in place, that you have explored all their interests. So it really reflects on what you're saying. Um, one interesting thing that I feel quite a few of you have said already, and we touched on it this morning, um, is this inhibitory fear that, and it's really a perception that you're not, you won't be as good in perhaps other areas of your life. Um, and a lot of the psychologists were talking about the fact that it can be paralyzing and it sort of, you know, keep you stuck in one place for quite some time, um, just because you don't feel that you will be able to climb that mountain again in, in a different field. Um, so I think that's, it's really interesting to hear you girls say that while you have been at the highest level and it, this is still something that, that was a challenge for you. Um, so uh, Neha, Lashinda, or Ali, can you uh, rebound a little bit on, you know, what was your biggest challenge? Uh, you touched a little bit on it, but uh, I'd like to, to hear a bit more. Um, Neha, you want to start? Yeah, sure. I think it's interesting that everyone talked about kind of that restart. And I think um, as athletes, we're so used to achieving and being successful from such a young age. Like we've always been good at something or really excelled or shined. That's why we kind of made it to the elite level that we did. And so, um, you know, really, I really struggled with, oh, I'm going to have to be zero at something again. Like I, you know, that was hard for the ego to swallow. Like I, I knew that, yeah, it takes grinding and hitting forehands and backhands and starting in the small tournaments to kind of build yourself up all the way to the U.S. Open but I couldn't kind of um, stomach the fact that at 25, 26, I would have to uh, start from zero again. And, and that really hampered with my exploration of trying to find another passion or a career that I found fulfilling because I was expecting and desiring immediate success. You know, even hobbies, I said, let me try to, you know, build my likes and, you know, things that I never had time for. 
photography, for example, you know, I remember being like, okay, if I pick up photography, like I have to be published in National Geographic by the end of the year, you know, and it was just a hobby just to learn. But these were the kinds of thoughts that were so debilitating for me. Um, but as I kind of processed them and, and looked really deeply at them, I, I recognized them as nothing but fear, Brenda, like you said, just fear of failure, fear of not being good enough, fear of not su succeeding again. So I think kind of reframing those thoughts that I had that, oh, I have to be the best, and if I'm not the best, I'm not gonna do it, um, to saying, okay, Neha, you're scared. You're scared to try again. Uh, and that, that was really hard for me. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting that you're touching on the fear and maybe we can have a, a group conversation on this a little bit. Um, because I, I'm, I'm curious if you have thought as to how can we better help athletes um, transition from a mindset perspective. You know, you want to move from that athlete perspective to a, a, a different way of approaching life. And it's not necessarily aligned with what you have done as, a, as an elite athlete. Um, it is very different and it just requires, because I, I feel you, you all have, and we all have the skills, the structure, the, capa the capacity to analyze a situation, put a strategy together, execute the strategy in a very good way. You've do all done that as athletes. That was like probably your best skills throughout your life, right? Um, but how do you switch that mindset so that you're not paralyzed in, in moving forward or perhaps it slows down that transition? How do we, we switch that mindset? Do you have any suggestion, Pashinda? Yeah. So I, I, you know, I think about this all the time because I'm a very introspective person. So um, athletes in particular, I feel, are coached so we know how to listen and we know how to kind of put things in action, like you said. Um, I think one of the things that should be started prior to transitioning is actually relearning who you are outside of an athlete. So as simple as just like determining things that you just like, because you're so used to doing things that you need to do or have to do that I think you often forget that you might not even like that. So, but you're doing it, you know, you're making it happen. So the simple things is just finding out you know what? I like cake. I like running. I like reading. I don't know. It's simple prompts that I think should be triggered. Um, so you can just find out who you are as a person outside of being an athlete. I think that's number one. Uh, number two is I think that you do not have to completely exonerate who you athlete when you're moving in this world what i found is that you can the language that we speak um synchronized swimming track and field tennis water polo you can it's it parallels a lot of things in life so for instance if i'm sitting in a meeting with someone and um they're speaking of uh, something that i'm just learning a new process a sales process that i'm learning um i immediately translate it to track terminology so I can understand it for myself. So I'm not completely leaving out what I've learned and what I perfected and what I'm mastered to, to move forward in this world. And I think that should be told as well. Like you can actually keep this with you and just kind of uh, put it, uh, gosh, what's the word? Just, just use it in a different way. So you don't feel like you're totally not that person because it is a part of you, it is a piece of you. You just have to utilize it in a, on the outside. And I think those are two important things that athletes should know, transitioning. Yeah. You're translating it into your own, your very own language that, that you're the most familiar with. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, Ali, you were gonna add. Yeah, I would like to see coaches help develop this and it can also be developed through the retirement process uh, to assist athletes with being more confident in their own creative process. Because a lot of times the sports, I don't think feels terribly creative because you're a part of a group or part of a team and your coach is just telling you what to do. And so there isn't really a lot of room for your own individual mind to make ideas. And so you don't have a lot of, uh, you don't have a lot of initiative. 
practice with initiative, taking initiative and then following things through, even just really simple goals. Like it could be like, I want to read three books by the end of this month and I'm just going to be happy about it when I'm done because that's what I wanted to do. And now I've done it or setting these really small goals for yourself. Like I want to be able to do 10 pull-ups. Okay. I'm just going to work up to that. And then there's no, there's no like reward coming. Nobody's going to tell me I did a good job. I'm not going to win any competitions, but so that, I guess that's kind of two things is discovering this kind of creative process that you can actually think of things you want to do and then have the, but have the confidence to try it. And also, uh, I don't remember what the second part of that was, but the confidence to be creative. I think that, that, uh, resonates with what we, uh, talked about yesterday where the, the, the role of a coach is evolving to being more of a, a facilitator. Um, and where, you know, we keep using this word of empowerment, but at the end of the day, it's giving you the tools to you as an athlete or as an individual to actually um, make your own decision and determine what you're doing. And it feels like a lot of the conversation we had yesterday was on the coaches um, enabling the athletes, so not giving all the tools up front and not just teaching those technical skills, but really enabling the athletes to. Um, investigate their own uh, and then within a group and then outside of their sport. Um, uh, uh, Brenda, do you have any suggestion um, on what can help through that transition process? Something that I've been thinking a lot about is like competition versus collaboration and I know that I play a team sport and we collaborate but we're ultimately still trying to make that top 13 so there's this competitiveness that comes with being an elite athlete and I feel like that I've had to I'm starting to rewire reframe for myself where it's like I can't ask for help it's okay like for me it's kind of in some ways showing weakness right like I can't do this but if I'm in a new system and it's okay to collaborate and it's it's preferred like go ahead and lean in so how do we bring that in to like comp the competitive nature of sports and the other thing that, that it makes me think about is being able to bring your full self to your team. And like we've all talked about hobbies or things that we love, like talking about that before we retire. But how do I include that as a part of the culture of the team so that we can help each other even before retirement or we can be creative if that's what it is that I want to do to show to my team. And I think will become better teammates and better teams if you can bring your full self and it's not, I don't know, so business. And it just, in the climate that we're in right now, I feel like there, there weren't many conversations where I was able to bring my full self to my teams and I think that would have helped. So that's what I'm thinking about right now. When I think it helps both ways, not only it helps you, but it helps your coaches and the rest of the team understand where you're coming from and who you are. Um, one of the presenters yesterday talked about it um, really well, and she called it an intersectionality, where you have to bring all of the aspect of your life um, to be your full self on, on, in the group, and that for the coaches, they have to consider all those aspects as well. Um, one question that I have, I guess, for all of you, as you talk about collaboration and, and asking for help, athletes do not ask for help. That's not what they do. We're not used to doing this. Uh, we're being, you know, often you're being told what to do and you execute and you try to repeat and execute better and better every time. Um, how do we teach athletes to ask for help? I mean, it seems like we talked about simple things. How do we teach athletes to ask for help? What, what could be good ways to do that? Um, and when do you have asked for help? Are there any triggers or stimulus that we need to be aware of? Um, I, can, I can answer, I guess, somewhat of what I think is an answer. Um, I think the way to, excuse the baby, <laughs> the, uh, the way to kind of force an athlete to ask for help is to present it in a training type of platform. No. So you might have an athlete that's struggling with oh gosh networking there can be trainings offered that say hey if you're thinking about building your network here's an avenue that you can go so i think like i said again 
uh, changing the conversation or the language into kind of the athlete terminology. So turning into, it's a training rather than asking for help. You know, um, it's a coaching, a, a life coach. That, that, those words trigger athletes and it doesn't sound the same, even though it's completely the same, as a therapist. So um, I think terminology is a strong point. Yeah. Anything else? Allie? Well, I would suggest if, if as the culture of all sports, we could just put these different training tools on the same shelf. Like, I wouldn't have trouble asking my coach, like, hey, can you help me with this one technical move that I need, you know, a little bit of assistance with? I'm not getting the end of it completely right. But for some reason, I think, so that's a technical physical skill, but for some reason I'm putting my technical physical skills on some kind of different shelf than my mental skills. Whether it's that I don't think those are as important or I think they're harder to achieve or I just don't know how to achieve them. They should all be on the same level. Like, of course you, you need a strong mind to be able to execute in the heat of the moment or whatever. You know, of course you need to, to eat right, to have a strong body, to, to have the energy to fuel you, to succeed. It's, they should all be on the same shelf. And for some reason in sports over the last however many decades, it's felt like most, at least my sport, I don't know if this is true in your sports, have just really emphasized the physical components, the physical technical skills. And I, for myself, I was a very, I was a very technically skilled athlete, but often had trouble performing under pressure because we never addressed any of these other issues. So if we could just normalize across the board, having all these things be on the same shelf, it might not be so hard to ask for help in a different area than a physical technical skill. Absolutely, that's a great point. Um, Neha, did you want to add anything? No, I think Ali really summarized that very well because I remember when I was an athlete and, uh, you know, I got tons of coaching on how to hit a perfect forehand or how to get more power on my serve. But when it came to, um, you know, uh, surviving under stress or thriving under pressure or, you know, trying to make that next step in my mental game, I was actually told, hey, this has to come from inside of you. You have to figure it out for yourself. If you can't figure it out, no one can help you and we're wasting time here. You know, so I really felt that I was coached to not ask questions around those kinds of things. Sorry, the baby. <laughs> um, you know, I really felt like I wasn't allowed to, I wasn't supposed to, somehow I was supposed to figure this out for myself. And if I didn't, it was a sign of failure and weakness. So I really think that when I coach tennis now, or when I'm on the court now, I'm really careful about asking the athlete, if, does this make sense? Do you have any questions? Where are you struggling? Like, that's where we start with. Uh, and that really opens the door to a lot more than just, um, I can't hit my back end today, or I can't feel this to like, how do I have more grit or how do I not choke on this point, you know, at 40 all. So I think a lot of it comes to how the coaches are approaching uh, what to do. And maybe the coaches just didn't know the answers. Now we know a lot more about um, mental health, mental performance than we did before. But I think that definitely in my case, there was this assumption that it has to come from inside me deep down. And if it's not there, then, I can't ask for help about it. I think that's a really good comment because you're basically saying, you know, this mental skill we should have inherently uh, and be born with, um, and that makes you different than someone else, uh, where the physical skill we can actually train. Um, and obviously we all know that you can train your mental game as much as you can train your physical game. Um, and it actually will be the part that probably differentiates you in the end. Uh, because we're all going to have the same level of, of physical skills when you get to the highest level. Um, I, I'm curious, Brenda, because you, you, you work with some younger uh, individuals. And so on that topic, and for all of you too, um, can we uh, approach those topics really early on with youth athletes and build it throughout their career so that they will be better prepared to transition out of sport and, and have uh, more perspective and reflection on their own self and career? I think we can. I think at each appropriate age, right, there's different language that we'll use, but I think we can and we should. I know a lot of 
collegiate athletes, like once they graduate, right, they have this so, the same sort of identity, I say identity crisis, for lack of a better word, than some of the elite athletes. And I think it could happen um, at different levels if you're committed to a sport. And one thing that was in my mind right now as I was hearing everyone speak was just how do we co-create these spaces, right? Like we're empowering the coach, but how can we do it with them so that um, everyone buys in? And that's just something I work in a school, so there's a lot of, of that going on, like norms, but I wonder how as coaches we could normalize it for our athletes and, and frame the question, did everyone understand that? Because usually I know that I need to frame it differently with half of my team is doing one thing and the other half is doing something else. It's like, I'm not reaching everyone. So it's like, how do coaches um, just self-evaluate and self-reflect and, and learn to shift with, with the team? Each team is different, right? It's, it's always so rigid and, and structured, which is fine because we need it, but you also need to know your team. And we, we have to be open to, to making those changes if it's the best thing for the culture of the team. But I do think we can start at a younger age. Yeah. And I think, you know, the, the, an organization like We Coach or the Coaching, the uh, Positive Coaching Alliance, they, they do a lot of work in that space um, and in building a, a different style, you know, influencing and, and encouraging a different style of coaching that perhaps we've seen way back, you know, in the 70s and 80s and 90s. Um, so I think that's going in the right direction. I, I'm not quite sure that athletes are aware of this type of organization and this type of, of of even different coaching style and philosophy. I, I don't know if they're even aware of that um, as they go through their career. Uh, Lashinda, you're going like this. No? No, I mean, I think that's just a hard no. <laughs> they're not aware of it. Um, so we talked about uh, identity challenges um, a lot. and But before that, you girls, some of you touched on the sort of the rejection of your sport, I want to say, at least for a period of time, um, the, uh, uh, this feeling of not wanting to do your sport or, or exercise um, after you retire. Uh, can we touch a little bit on, on, your, uh, on the physical part of your transition, um, especially as you become mother and you have a really busy life and there's a lot of things going on between work, family, um, school and other aspects. Um, how and have you been able to manage uh, your health, healthy lifestyle, continuing to exercise if at all, wanting to exercise if at all? Um, how that as how is that aspect of, of things? Um, Neha, you can go. Yeah, I can go. I um, I guess for me, initially, immediately after I retired. Um, I had a really hard time not doing physical activity uh, because my day was so structured. I'd wake up, work out for like seven hours a day. So I actually felt, I had this really weird feeling. I had the sensation that I, I was dirty and that I had to go and like sweat or do something really rigorous and physical, uh, almost like taking a shower. And if I didn't do that every day, it just was this very uncomfortable feeling for me. I also had a really hard time in my first office job, sitting down from like nine to five. I really struggled with that. I would find those BOSU balls, I would stand up. Like I just tried everything I could to not sit down because my, my physical body just felt so, uh, just uncomfortable, I guess. And um, I think, I slowly kind of learned, okay, this is a, a normal day. This is how most people can get their exercise in, in the morning or in the afternoon and get it out of your system. But there was a, a good period of time where I was just like, if I don't go and do something, I don't know how I can live within my own body. Um, now it's come to, um, I'm a mom of uh, two young children. So right now for me, it's like a great day if I can get out for a walk or lift some weights. It's a great day. Um, and I think what's most important for me at this point, I'm now 12, 13 years out of retire, uh, from retirement. And I think the biggest thing for me or, or what I think about the most is my strength. I want to continue to feel and be strong. 
I'm not so particular about how my body looks, but I really care about if I can continue to stay at a certain strength level and an energy level. I think those are the two most important things for me. And the way I achieve that has, is completely different. I am no longer putting these in, you know, intense workouts in front of me that I have to accomplish. Uh, but the goal is the same. You know, I want to feel strong and I want to feel like I can, um, you know, have the energy throughout the day. Great. Lashinda, do you want to share with us how your, uh, your, your exercise routine is? If you have any, you're a busy lady. I really too. have an exercise routine. <laughs> it was, you know, it was hard for me to start working out again because it just reminded me of what I was no longer doing. So that's kind of what I struggled with. I'm like, ah, I don't want to work out. What am I working out for? It's nothing. I'm not, you know, it's not, I'm not reaching a goal. Like, why am I really working out? But um, so I've, I've recently started working out probably three weeks ago. And um, one of the reasons is because I'm dealing with things health wise that I've never had to, you know, think about. So the, my stress level, because I told you about my anxiety, um, has created a blood pressure issue. So I have to find a way to like relieve stress. So I, that kind of encouraged me and forced me to get out there and just start working out again. So I'm like reached a two and a half mile run, which I was like, oh my gosh, I haven't did this in so long. But, but um, so I'm doing that and it actually does feel good. It feels good to work out and uh, release some of those endorphins. And uh, um, so that's where I am now. So I'm, I just put myself at twice a week. I'll make sure I go out and do something. And it's nothing like, I don't want anything too um, military, you know, I just, I want to just do something active that I enjoy doing. If it, if it's running that day, it's running, you know, I don't want to force anything, but that's where I'm at with it because uh, I can easily turn it into something competitive for no reason at all. And I don't want to <laughs> go there again. So. Right. Uh, Brenda, do you still play? Or do you do anything else? You know, for me, I I really only enjoy working out in the water. Running was never a strong suit of mine. Um, I wish that I enjoyed it because there's easier access to run. And I just, I really just enjoy playing and swimming. And now having two young kids and seeing like body changes, it's, you know, it's like, I need to get in the water. And like Niho was saying, like, I just want to be strong and active for them. So it's like, how do I make sure that I find something that I enjoy that I can do anywhere in addition to when I can get into the pool and play? Um, I've never really, I think this is the longest period of time since the pandemic that I haven't played like a game uh, because I, I will get in and just scrimmage because I think I'm still 20 years old and people have to tell me like, Brenda, <laughs> you can't just do that. But yeah, just trying to figure it out. I want to be able to be active for my kids. Um, so I'm still working on it. But yes, I want to be strong and active. Yeah. Um, I want to hear from Allie because her and I have the same sport and um, she probably has a different approach to mine where I sort of went to do everything else but synchronized swimming and everything that was outside of the pool. Uh, I, I love doing synchro, but I actually enjoy more things that haven't done as much perhaps in my life. But I think Ali has a different uh, exercise routine and love, so I would love to hear what you have to say. I've known Miriam six times and I think I've only got her in the pool twice. I've known Miriam for six years and I think I've only got her in the pool twice. <laughs> One day. Or maybe not. <laughs> Um, well, for four years, I didn't want to do, it wasn't, so I did still swim, but it was on and off and there was something very different about it. Like I wouldn't do anything hard at all. I just couldn't get myself to really work out or push my body in any way. Uh, I think I was just sad, uh, and traumatized and I just couldn't get myself to want to really try at anything. And that kind of changed recently. Actually, I started working out again. And I realized, especially during this time of pandemic, when time kind of has gone out the window and structure has gone out the window, everything feels kind of dreamlike to me. And it's been hard for me to figure out like what's real and what's a dream kind of like, was that last week? Was that last year? I'm not sure. 
like what happened yesterday or an hour can feel like a whole day sometimes. And so in struggling with this kind of perception of reality, I've actually reconnected to this idea that working out and feeling like my muscles getting sore is making me feel more connected to my body more in the present moment. And like things are more real, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm really enjoying that. And I've started doing, I also picked up skateboarding during the pandemic, which I realized is like the ultimate pandemic activity because <laughs> it just turns all the streets into a playground <laughs> and you can do it anytime, anywhere, really. Uh, so like, with, like Brenda said, with swimming, it's hard because of access to pools. And then with the pandemic, I just had to switch into natural bodies of water. And I feel completely different about that than I did about swimming in chlorine. Now I realize that swimming in chlorine is actually really disgusting and gross and kind of unhealthy for you. And yeah, I don't really know why I didn't talk about that the 20 years I was doing it, but I, yeah, I guess we're just not gonna keep not talking about it. But getting, get, getting in the ocean has been a really different, a totally different type of experience that feels very healing. And it feels like the ocean is holding me and it feels like therapy. Like I go to the ocean in the morning and I feel like I came out, I feel like better than I do after an hour with a therapist or something. I just give all my worry to the water and then come back out. But, and then other than that, I'm just trying to do something every day. Yoga really helped me when I didn't want to work out. I did get certified as a yoga teacher trainer and, and that gave me kind of the opposite because I didn't want to work out and yoga is not a workout and so it supported me um, I think more emotionally but also giving me some physical support during that time when I actually couldn't get myself to work out so I think people who really mentally or emotionally are not in a shape to do work to work out I would recommend yoga as a possible method for them to support them through that part of their process. I can't, I can't relate to the, uh, the ocean swim alley because my years after I retired, when I lived in Australia, I swam in the ocean every morning. So does this mean you're going to start coming to the Pacific ocean with me? Maybe. I Perfect. I'm, I'm, We're going on Monday, all the mermaids. See you there. Um, ladies, we actually getting uh, closer to the end of the morning. So I want to go through a round on, um, sort of in your ideal, in an ideal scenario, if you were to retire again, um, what kind of support would you like to have? Um, you know, what would be your recommendation for organization and providers um, to help you through it? Now that if you've gone through it, you may be still processing, you know, you've had time to sort of reflect and feel it and um, what recommendation do you have for us? I can start. Go for it. Okay. So I, I don't, if, if I can start over, I would have some type of sorority. So something for athletes specifically, where you have a group of people that are going on this journey together, starting like to me, the earliest high school, um, to have some sort of roadmap and connections with people that have already been through it. So similar to, to what you're doing with Athletes So, except just starting earlier. Yeah. Just yeah, and you'll you have this huge network and um that you can always go back to and then you're act also kind of um uh called on to do certain certain things to remain in this sorority. Um so the mentors, I I've always speak on that. I think it's important and I think that's something that at minimum in college, you should start having someone that you can speak to uh, pertaining to transitioning, even from just a student athlete. Um, um, gosh, uh, I think that's, that's just the most important thing because for me, um, I wish I would have had someone to speak to and that someone actually willing to give their time because you have a ton of people that'll give you a conversation, but beyond that, it's tough to get someone to actually invest themselves into you. Mm -hmm. That's asking a lot of a person. So um, to really find someone that was willing to do that, where I can really run to, or even someone that can call me out on something without me asking, saying, hey, you're kind of on the wrong path. You might want, you might want to think of this, would have been just life-changing for me. So... I would um, encourage athletes, young athletes to start there. Yeah. Brenda, do you want to add as well? Yeah. Yes. Um, I will give a shout out to USA Water Polo. They're in the process of setting up this like business council where athletes could do internships or do um, get ex work experience as their training. And I think that's something that I wish I would have had just to see like, this isn't for me. This is for me. 
And this is something that I remember talking about with our CEO and our chairman, like in 2007, when they first came on, but it has taken just a while to get going. But I think if this was offered um, at different times for everyone, I don't know if it's a partnership with the USOC, I know USOPC, I know they offer um, programs, but I don't know how many athletes actually use them. So I think if there was more collaboration between NGBs or sharing best practices, then maybe all of us could have an opportunity to explore something and it would shift the culture that some athletes can train and also start thinking about just life outside of sports. And some athletes may choose just to think about sports, but give us that other option. Yep. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think the ground is shifting in the transition space, there's a lot of things coming up. There's a lot of organization thinking about it and putting things in place. So I think we, we're getting closer um, and we'll see way more coming up. Um, uh, Ali, do you, anything that you would have wanted to see or have? I think it would be nice if the organization could provide six months of psychological, at least psychological and nutritional support after you leave. And to even have somebody from the organization just call you maybe once a month or even text you or email you to say like, hi, Brenda, like, are you still alive over there? I mean, you, you gave 16 years of your life to USA Water Polo and now you're gone. Like, but you're, you know, are you alive? Are you well? How's it going? You know, just the very basic, simple thing to help you make you feel like you're still connected. Because I know the weirdest thing about leaving national team training is because national team training, at least in synchronized swimming, is so immersive. You it's everything. It's your whole world. It's your whole day. You give, you give everything you have. And then you leave and you're like, did that even happen? Or was it just a dream? What, was I really on the team for 10 years? And you just feel so disconnected. So anything that kind of helps you feel even just a little bit of a thread to like connect your old and your new threads together. That's a good image. Um, Neha? Yeah, I second everything that everyone has said uh, so far on this panel. I think I wanted to add a few points. I think one is that, you know, at the end of the day, when you're training to be an athlete, um, you want to be, if you want to be the best, it's very hard to achieve a balance or a semblance of balance and to even, you know, dedicate two weeks or a, a couple of days to exploring other thing, other facets of who you are, even though that's so important. So I think, um, what I would love to see is more research around uh, people's experiences of transitioning and uh, more data around it. I think uh, when you put academic uh, research behind this and data around it, a lot of things, policies change. And I think overall, um, just sort of the culture of how we um, talk about um, and the culture at young people to sports and, and to athletic careers, um, understanding and coaches, parents, uh, people around the sport, knowing that this is a short-lived part of a young person's life and that it will probably end much earlier than most careers. And actually having these young people write out their um, plans post-athletic uh, post careers, starting from a very young age, knowing that, yes, I wanna do this for a concentrated period of my life, but I also have these other aspirations. And I think like Lashinda and Brenda mentioned, having in the, those checkpoints throughout the journey saying, okay, you know, are you establishing for the next 10 years? Are you making that groundwork for the next 10 years? I think we all get so myopic, so hyper-focused, so dedicated, uh, sacrificing everything about ourselves and everything for that one moment. And then uh, I think we forget. So I, I would like to see it start in the youth camps and before that, and even through the government structures of, okay, all these athletes have to have um, their second plan, their next chapter in line, and we need someone to help guide them along the way. And we have the research and data to back that up. Well, Neha, I can't only second that because, you know, I come from a country where it's compulsory to actually pursue your education at, while you're competing professionally. Um, otherwise, you don't get your uh, your uh, grant. So it's actually um, at least that's one step. But I think there's a lot of other aspects we want to develop. But um, ladies, I, I want to thank you for.
taking the time to join and share um, and be vulnerable. I know, Lashinda, you started by saying, you know, that um, you, you were not really ready back in, you know, a couple of years ago when you retired to actually share about your struggle. And now that you're able to, like, voice it and articulate it, I think it's, it's, it's really great that you were able to share with us. And um, just for all of you to be able to talk through it and, um, and give us some insight on what we can do better. Uh, because that's the goal here, and especially with athletes, so the idea, you know, a lot of the topics you mentioned are things that we're working on and we're trying to push further, um, including working on wellness and life skill uh, courses and resources for younger athletes as, as young as high school as well. Um, so hopefully that goes in, in the right direction, but really appreciate your contribution and, and sharing your insight. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and basically, this is the, uh, the conclusion of, of this two-day uh, marathon virtual summit, Feed the Soul. Uh, we've heard a lot uh, from many different speakers and, and really informative and educational, and, and how, I hope everybody um, enjoyed it. Uh, I invite you to visit our website at athletesoul.space, um, and we'll have more information on this event, um, the recording of all the, uh, the sessions, um, as well as some, some follow-up information with some courses available too. Um, so ladies, thank you again. Have a, a lovely weekend. Appreciate it. Um, and, and good luck with everything that, that you get to. All right. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.